Good morning. Uh, my name is Bob Lamb. I chair the Securities and Corporate Governance Practice at Gunster, and I'm delighted to be moderating this fantastic uh, panel, which I will introduce to you shortly. Uh, I'd like to start out with a brief recap of how we got here. The impetus for this webinar was initially the SEC's proposal issued in March 2022 to require public companies to make extensive disclosures about climate change. However, over time and for various reasons, we realized that the SEC proposal is irrelevant. For that reason, I won't take the time to describe it. Instead, I suggest you read our March 23 e-alert, which can be found on our website, gunster.com, under news and updates, alerts and publications. You're also going to get a link to that e-alert uh, following today's program. However, it may be helpful to understand why we think the SEC's proposal is irrelevant. First, we have no doubt that if adopted, the SEC proposal will be challenged in the courts. In fact, one expert of my acquaintance has said that there is a 100% probability that the rule will be judicially challenged. And while it's always risky to predict litigation outcomes, the current odds are that the litigation could be successful, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly given the recent Supreme Court decision affecting the EPA, which we'll discuss shortly. In any event, one immediate result of the litigation is that the effectiveness of the rule will be suspended by the SEC or by the courts, uh, which would enjoin the SEC from enforcing it pending the outcome of the litigation, which could take years. Second, the SEC proposal has generated opposition in both houses of Congress. If, as has been predicted, the Republicans take control of the House, we could easily see this, the SEC's budget appropriation include a prohibition against adoption of the rule. This has happened for several years with respect to disclosures of corporate political contributions. However, the principal reason for our belief that the SEC proposal is irrelevant is that the information that would be disclosed under the proposal is already being requested or required. Stated simply, whether your business is large or small, uh, public or privately held, in a dirty industry or a clean one, your constituencies, your customers, employees, regulators, investors, and the communities where you operate already want this information. So with that as prologue, let me introduce our panelists who will explain who is asking for this information, what information is expected or required to be provided, how you can get the information and its impact on public company executive compensation. First off, Robert Manning is a shareholder at Gunster with nearly three decades of experience in air quality and climate related matters. Robert will provide an overview of existing legal requirements for disclosures and public pressures for and uses of climate data. Clara Tays is a partner at Pay Governance LLC, an executive compensation consulting firm. Tara has been advising comp committees and management on various executive compensation matters for over the last 25 years. Tara will discuss the inclusion of climate metrics and executive compensation and approaches and requirements for third-party verification of climate data. Last and not least, Guy Zirkelback is the co-founder of Sustainabase, which has developed a software platform to help companies manage and report carbon emissions, water, waste, and more. Guida will discuss climate protocols and standards, how to accurately and consistently measure and track ESG data, and how to use good data to avoid greenwashing and to inform real strategy. Two more notes. First, each of our panelists, including me as moderator, will be asking questions of each other, and we encourage you to do likewise using the questions menu in the GoToWebinar control panel on your screen. Second, we have been approved for one hour of CLE credit by the Florida Bar. We will send out the course number within the next few days, together with some materials and links to other materials that will be of interest to you, and the names and contact information for all of the panelists. You should feel free to reach out to them or to me with any follow-up questions, comments, or otherwise. So let's start out with Robert. Um, we'll make it easy, Robert, um, at least broad. What are some of the existing legal requirements compelling disclosure? Thank you, Bob, and, and good morning. Um, there's a variety of existing legal requirements that, re, that, that compel companies to both monitor and report greenhouse gas emissions. Um, most of those are direct emissions of scope one uh, if they occur above a certain threshold. 
Um, the electric utility industry, for example, under the acid rain program has been required to report CO2 data for several decades, uh, ever since the beginning of the acid rain program. Um, EPA has a separate reporting rule. It's in 40 CFR part 98. It's the greenhouse gas reporting rule. And it covers, I believe there's 42 industry categories that if you're above a certain level of emissions, typically it's 25,000 ton metric tons of CO2 equivalent, um, then, and you're in one of the industry categories, then you're required to report annually. This program has been around since about 2010. Um, and last I saw, I think there's about 8,000 facilities nationally that are subject to uh, that reporting rule. Um, so there's already a lot of data that's been uh, required and generated that's out there. A couple of other national level laws, uh, the NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, um, there, there are some FERC requirements for, those involve uh, federal projects or, or large projects, but certainly there's embedded requirements regarding um, greenhouse gas emissions there. There's also a variety of emission limits. Uh, what we've talked about, what I've mentioned so far are just monitoring and reporting. Tell us what you're doing. Um, there's other requirements that actually require you, that, that limit your ability to, uh, facilities ability to emit and, and may require it to be reduced with certain technologies and such. Um, EPA has a, a variety of those types of rules already on the books. Uh, many more are coming, um, but for, for example, landfills, uh, the auto industry, aircrafts, oil and gas exploration, um, all have existing regulations on the books that require limits, uh, you know, lessening of, uh, of the emissions. Um, there's also some permitting programs that are triggered if a facility emits above certain thresholds. Um, and depending on the, the quantity of emissions could require uh, additional reductions, um, what's called best available control technology, which would compel uh, at least monitoring and reporting and typically depending on the types of devices that are involved, um, a, a reduction in emissions. There's also beyond the federal level, there's quite a few states that have greenhouse gas laws uh, related to monitoring and reporting. Um, there, you know, California has some, um, and there's also uh, uh, companies that are subject to public service commissions, um, you know, integrated resource planning, um, th those types of requirements also include a, a greenhouse gas uh, component to it. Um, at, again, at the state level. Um, internationally, um, there, there are also laws for, for those companies that, um, you know, work in the international sphere, the, the UK, uh, the European Union, um, South Africa, Australia, all have greenhouse gas, uh, mostly monitoring and reporting requirements. Um, but typically, again, all of these that I've mentioned kick in if you're above a certain threshold. They're, they're not aimed at the really small emitters. Um, there are several pending, you know, more are coming. There's several pending proposals. The SEC one that, that Bob mentioned earlier, there's also, there's actually two SEC ones. There's another one uh, related to ESG uh, disclosures, which would include climate greenhouse gas data. Uh, that's, that's in proposed form now. The Department of Transportation at the federal level also has some proposed rules they just released um, requiring states to both monitor and set targets to reduce um, vehicle emissions. Um, so that, that, that will be an interesting, assuming it goes final, um, it will be an interesting exercise for states to, to develop that. Uh, one last note on the, the legal requirements. Um, I've gone through several higher level, but uh, one of the important things to remember is to keep an eye on the form of the data that's required. Um, the acid rain program, for example, just requires CO2 data. 
Um, other programs require the rest of the greenhouse gases. Some of them require it in tons per year on a mass level. Some require it at a rate level, pound per unit per production, like pounds per megawatt hour. Um, and so it, it's important, and some of them require it at the facility level, some at the unit level, some at the company level, some at the state level. Um, so it's it's real important to to be focused on what what the requirement um, is actually calling you to do. Yeah, my my head is kind of spinning, um, but <laughs> you've explained very well why we opted to diverge from just the SEC rule. Um, You've talked about the requirements, Robert, but how how does climate in impact uh, climate and the disclosure of, of the things you were talking about? How does that impact company projects? And you, you mentioned, um, you know, that these are the, the regulations that, and the laws that are in place are not really designed to impact what I'll call mom and pop operations. <clears throat> but you know, I'd, I'd also be be curious if you can include in your answer. You know, at what level do they start to kick in? I mean, if you're opening up, you know, a, a, a convenience store, maybe not. But at what level do they do they start to kick in? So I'll throw it back to you. Okay. Um, you know, that's a fun um, but very detailed answer. Um, a lot of projects, um, and it's all based on emissions. So for greenhouse gas emissions, the threshold sounds high it's at 75,000 tons per year um, but it's basically in correlated with the some of the other pollutants which are often you know at 100 tons per year or 250 tons per year um, and that would kick in that would require um, the companies to get permits uh, in, in and deal with the data that they are either already emitting or going to emit for a new facility. Um, they have to build it in and, and describe all of that. And, and if emissions are above a certain level, then they have to put in the, the best available control technology to actually minimize their emissions. Um, it can also come in. So, so uh, there's a lot of information that the company has to, if they're above a certain level, both for a new facility or a revision, a, a, a expansion, a modification of an existing facility. Um, and it's the same basic thresholds. If your modification or, or expansion of a facility also exceeds that 75,000 um, level, then there are some uh, permitting and extra requirements that kick in. Uh, the disclosure requirements, just the typical monitoring and reporting, those are governed by the EPA reporting rule, which again is typically at the 25,000 ton per year level. And again, that's metric ton CO2 equivalents. Um, so, and that's a mouthful right there. Um, but it's important to remember that we're not just talking about CO2. We're talking about all of the, I think there's eight, uh, six or eight um, different greenhouse gases. Um, another area where it, it comes uh, to, you know, is used is in opposition to projects. Um, a lot, this, you know, climate, um, it can be used, the environmental justice context is um, getting a lot of uh, tailwinds now. Um, and, it, and is you know that that perspective is brought to a lot of projects um, that come about. There can be um, projects that may not um, you know may actually increase at your project level, but it may allow the company to do something company wide that's less emitting um, and therefore beneficial to the environment. Um, so there's a lot of uh, you know, calculations and, and uh, understanding of what your project is going to do, what your facility does, um, you know, what are the opponents potentially going to reach for um, if there are, you know, certain increases or increases, like I mentioned, in nearby environmental justice communities. Um, so that it, it's a it, it's a detailed answer. Um, hopefully, I, I hit some of the highlights for you. Yeah, well, my head is still spinning, but that's okay. That's that's why we're here. Um, and I hesitate to ask the next question, but it won't stop me. Um, 
What are some other situations where you're seeing companies being asked to provide uh, greenhouse gas emissions data? Well, what I've described so far is, is the legal requirements. Um, there are a lot of efforts underway um, to, to voluntarily um, either ask for or, or produce this type of information, uh, whether it's from shareholders, um, local governments. Um, I've seen it fairly recently, uh, cities and counties looking to develop their own plans on you know, status and reduction goals um, that they might want to put out there. So they reach out to the companies and say, please give us your data um, so that we can understand what our baseline is in our county, for example. Um, now, some companies already have this data and, and it's fairly easy to just forward on, but often um, what happens is the data that's being requested is in either a geographic region or a format um, that, that is not uh, already produced, that is not readily available. And so then, you know, you have to weigh the relationship with whoever's asking versus the burden of, of developing and, and producing that data. Um, and, you know, I, I've seen it go both ways where, where companies have just referred certain entities to already publicly available data um, and I've seen some folks go to a, a lot of extra effort to mine their own uh, information and, and data databases to to try to give them uh, more of, of what they're asking for. Um, but there certainly are a lot of voluntary requests for the information. Um, another one, I guess, I don't think I mentioned earlier um, in the renewable energy credit market, um, those can have legal requirements attached to them, um, but that's an area where, you know, a lot of folks are, are wanting, companies are wanting to participate um, in those markets, um, both to offer credits and to uh, offset their own emissions. Um, so that, that, that's another area that, that may or may not have a legal requirement attached to it, but it is certainly uh, rich in, in data needs right now. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll just, uh, as an aside, I'll point out, you mentioned um, investors asking for this data. Um, we'll never know exactly why the SEC came out with uh, the specific proposals that it proposed, but I, I think it's fair to say that the investor community in general has been far out in front of the SEC uh, in asking companies to provide climate change data, not necessarily all the same things that the SEC is going for. And I've heard some speculation that the SEC um, really felt that it, it had to show that it wasn't just playing catch up ball, um, that it was really going beyond what, what investors had been asking for. Um, the next question, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I think you've answered it in part, but I'll ask it more explicitly. <clears throat> Can data that's been developed for one program or purpose be used for another? I mean, how much of a, slice and dice can a company engage in uh, so, so as to minimize uh, its, its expenses in developing and disclosing this data? Sure. Um, you know, the answer is hopefully <laughs> it's usable um, in both programs. Um, unfortunately, a lot of what I uh, have seen is that it's asked for a different format. Um, it's asked for, you know, different um, specificity, different times different geographic areas, like I mentioned, the company level versus unit level versus state level versus, you know, uh, zip code level. I've heard of, you know, certain folks wanting it at that, uh, at that type of, you know, specificity. And, you know, if you're just producing uh, according to the EPA requirements, if you're telling them what you do on a tons per year basis or a pound per unit of production basis, you know, that, that's a very different set of data than somebody wanting a zip code level for the month of July, <laughs> um, you know, from, you know, for the entire, you know, and, and it's a challenge for the companies, or, or sorry, for the cities and counties, um, if they're really trying to understand that as well. Um, but that's, uh, you know, I can also say everybody that I've worked with, they, they certainly yearn for desire to to be able to use it. Um, they don't want to they don't want to do something again. 
um, they, they want consistency, they want accuracy, they want credibility um, in the data they produce. And, and so the, the more you can bring common protocols and approaches, um, the, the, the better off everybody is. Yeah. We're just not there yet. That, that's a really good point. And my last question for you, at least for the time being, and I'm, I'm going to request that, that we try to be succinct because the answer to this question could take up the rest of the hour. Um, we're all familiar, or at least I assume we're all familiar with the recent Supreme Court decision impacting the EPA. Um, you mentioned EPA limits on emissions earlier. I mean, how, how does that decision impact all of this? Well, the, the short answer is it doesn't directly. Um, the, the, e, the Supreme Court decision really dealt with EPA's authority to regulate greenhouse gases from electric utility from existing electric utility units, and the court said they went too far. Um, they, they still have an obligation to uh, regulate those emissions and to, and to develop a new rule that, that um, is uh, in line with the court's decision. Now, the, the rest of the, you know, the majority of the decision talked about the, the major questions doctrine, which is, uh, you know, a fun one for, for lawyers to sit around and talk about. Um, but that one basically, uh, you know, calls into question any agency, not just EPA, but any future agency regulation, um, uh, you know, somebody now has a roadmap within that decision to argue that the agency uh, went too far, that if it's a highly consequential action and the statutory authority is not express, is not very clear, then there's your, you know, pathway to push back against whatever that regulation is. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the agencies are also now going to be taking more effort and time to tie their actions to express, you know, or try to connect the dots um, to, to, to the express statutory authority. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, there's going to be more litigation on this, um, on that point, um, but I would expect that any significant agency action is going to have to deal now with the major questions doctrine and, and that Supreme Court decision. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's a great answer. I do have some more questions for you, but I, I don't want to ignore our other panelists. So now I'm going to turn to Gaida, um, if I may. And just a reminder to, <clears throat> excuse me, to our attendees, again, please feel free to ask questions uh, in the question box in the uh, go to meeting control panel. So Gaida, um, a lot of the comments that were submitted to the SEC on its climate change disclosure proposal, noted, uh, complained about whatever word you want to choose, uh, the effort and cost involved in gathering the data that the proposal would require. Um, do you have any reliable estimates of the man hours or person hours and other costs involved? And obviously it's a very broad question, so make it as, make it as narrow as you can or as broad as you can. Sure. Um... It really uh, varies by the type or the size of company and what their operations are like. It also varies based on the technology systems the company has in place that houses all this data so that you can pull it and automate it. So what we keep hearing from companies is that it could be taking them hundreds of hours of either employee time or consultant time um, until we can figure out ways to automate and pull this data in a consistent manner so that you reduce that or eliminate it, right? So, so it's all about streamlining, finding, finding these automated systems. Um, can we pull up the carbon value chain? Um, to, I wanna show everybody, uh, and this may be something some of you already know, but this shows you where carbon comes from, basically, and all the gases we, we were talking about. So Robert was talking about, you know, MTCO2E that includes all these gases you see at the top, right? So if you have your company, it's a reporting company, you've got your facilities and you've got your vehicles, and those are typically referred to as scope one emissions. And within that, you've got gasoline, you've got different fuels, you've got electricity, natural gas, all these things, all this activity data, you have to gather, pull consistently in a protocol compliant manner uh, to then get your scope one direct emissions, right? Um, you're also having your scope two emissions that are indirect. It means you're not, not actually producing an emission at your facility, but 
you're purchasing electricity or heating or cooling and you're using it at your facility. And so that's scope two because it's indirect. And then finally, you've got your entire supply chain, right? So everything from business travel upstream to transportation and distribution, purchase goods and services, et cetera. And all of the information from those items is in your supply chain um, and you need to gather that information to report. So as you can see, um, depending on how much you're looking to measure and track and report, uh, it depends on your company's operations, where all this data is coming from. So how long is it going to take you? Um, I'll tell you, we've worked with some, well, let me step back. Um, Robert was talking about, you know, why are companies doing this? In our case, um, as a carbon accounting software platform, it really has been driven for our customers more from voluntary disclosures. And a lot of the times because they either are a very large company that has made disclosures about their targets. They've claimed they're going to go net zero. They've claimed they're going to reduce X percent of their emissions from their baseline year by a certain year, or they are a supplier to one of those companies, right? So then if the supplier is in their supply chain and the company is trying to decarbonize its supply chain, of course, it's going to want metrics and reporting from the company and its supply chain. Um, so that's from our perspective and just hopefully this gives you a visual, I gave you like a little carbon 101 of where it all comes from and why it's so disparate and messy and hard to get um, and why it matters uh, what your operations are like and what your uh, technology systems in the back end are like um, in the terms of hours. Yeah. And, and I think uh, we can get rid of the carbon value chain image now. While that slide is coming down, just a comment, you know, you, you talked about companies doing this voluntarily. Um, there is data out there showing that as the workforce becomes increasingly populated by millennials um, who, who care very much about climate change, we're certainly seeing the effects of it this summer, um, the companies are, are becoming more attuned to it because they want to maintain their workforce. They don't, they don't want their employees to go running off to some other company that has a better environmental track record than they do because people are doing that. Um, people are actually leaving jobs because they, they don't feel comfortable staying with a company that isn't getting with the program. Um, yeah, we've seen on. that be, uh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, we've seen that, so the, I, this issue is under the microscope right now, and, and you, you know, Robert was saying it's under the microscope from investors, from customers, um, from employees, right? So that's why um, it's uh, gotten to the point where people are savvy enough now to know that if you're doing some big estimated number that you don't have data to back it up with, it's just not going to fly anymore. Just like you wouldn't estimate your financial statements. I think like the days of estimating your carbon footprint are pretty much over, right? So you've got to know why you're, that you're saying something that's true and have the data to back it up. And, you know, employees are savvy. Yes, those millennials and, and even people older than that, they're, they're coming to understand that, wait a minute, what does that really mean? What are they disclosing? And if they have a reduction target that they've made public, have what steps are they taking to get there? And have they made any progress? And people are really looking at this. Yeah, we'll get into that a little bit more when, when uh, Tara gets up to the platform. Um, Robert discussed all sorts of requirements for data outside of the SCC proposal. Um, as a general matter, and I, I realize, you know, all generalizations are false, including this one, but are the costs of compliance with the types of requirements that Robert referred to comparable to those that might be expected under the SEC proposal? Gosh, I think the costs, again, are similar to ours because they're very much related, right? So depends on the size of the company, depends on the complexity of the operations. It depends on how much up and down that supply chain you need to track and report and disclose. Um, there was a piece in the Wall Street Journal recently where CFOs were talking about that they are using technology to minimize those costs, right, and to streamline operations and to create those repeatable, audible processes, right, which is what we're trying to do. Um, but I will argue that the cost of non-compliance is going to be much higher. So the technology is there, right? Like we can help companies get whatever they want to do, you know, let's track it and let's keep up this consistent automated way to do it over and over again. But if they don't 
start tracking this. And if they make claims that are not true, and if they can't back up what they're doing, their cost of compliance, they're going to have PR nightmares that might be much more costly than that, right? Greenwashing claims. There was just uh, this morning uh, from the Association of Corporate Counsel, an article that was published, um, you know, about how much greenwashing claims are going to go on the rise, whether they're private or from regulators, right? So um, that's a big cost. And we're seeing more and more opportunity costs um, because if you want to win a procurement bid or you are involved in a project or want to be involved in a project where the decision maker cares about this or is requiring it, requiring it as part of an RFP process or as part of being a vendor, there's this huge opportunity cost there. Um, and you mentioned employees, you know, there's also this, um, can you attract the talent that you want if you don't, if you're not a company that is doing something about this important issue? Um, so that, I think that's my argument is that there are some costs of compliance, but I think the cost of non-compliance or no action are going to be greater over time. Yeah, and, and you mentioned reputational damage, which I, I, I think can never be overestimated. Um, you know, it can, it can really damage a company. Um, what are some of the ways in which companies are preparing their internal staff and resources and, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and sort of another question that, that relates to that, how, how is technology helping? I mean, just as one example, um, when you showed the slide on, on the sources of, of carbon, uh, business travel, um, if I go on a business trip for Gunster and, uh, you know, I'm taking my car, which I'm pleased to say is a plug-in hybrid, um, mm -hmm. versus my wife's car, which is an electric car. Um, how, how would Gunster even know that to, to report on, on its scope three emissions? So there are things in the world of data that we have and, and things that we don't. So we're not in, in, the e, in the E of the ESG world. We're not yet, and even in the SMG, we're not in a place like financial data where every bank is currently streaming it and you can connect to an API and get it and put it into something else, right? We're slowly getting there. That's exactly what we're doing at Sustainabase. Um, and, but what we are finding is that um, Robert was talking about how for different disclosure requirements, you have to splice and dice this data in different ways, right? Um, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with things like just TCFD, where at the center of the TCFD, there's this, it's an onion and at the center are metrics, right? So that's really the heart. So if you get this data, you know, for example, in your case, whatever data the travel system has from the company or the supplier, you know, we get the data, we churn it, we do the science, we the calculations, the right emissions factors, et cetera. But once you have those metrics, then using technology, you can pull those metrics often, and then you can splice and dice those metrics to see them in whichever manner you need to see them and report them, right? So if you have your scope one, two, three, and you wanna see them by certain intensity metric, number of employees, units of revenue, you know, whatever it might be, you can do that. If you need to drill down and see it by zip code, by location, by facility, by department, you can do that. So that's gonna become more important as you have to disclose out all these different, I call it the alphabet soup of disclosures right now because there's so many, there's the CDP, there's SASB, TCFD, all the ones Robert mentioned. And so, you know, you have to be able to be, um, flexible in how you take this information to put it out to the world. Um, but companies are, I'm totally going away from your original question, which was oh, how are companies um, preparing their internal staff? Um, so I think one important one is attending webinars like this, right? So you're exposing, allowing employees to go to events like this and becoming informed and understanding what the scope of the problem is. Um, I think also putting budgets behind this issue so that internal staff doesn't have to become a carbon accounting expert or an SEC climate disclosure expert so that they can hire a Gunster or they can hire Tara, you know, so that they can use these experts to help them do this right and not have a problem. Um, and then the other thing that we keep seeing is the elevation of the sustainability officer role. Um, in the past year, the chief sustainability officer role has tripled and 28% hold executive positions, right? So when you elevate the role to this executive level role, it becomes a conversation for the entire company and not the siloed specific small piece. Um, that's really important. Yeah, and, and is it fair to say um, 
well, I shouldn't phrase it as a, as a statement, I'll phrase it as a question. <clears throat> Excuse me, to what extent can technology um, limit the need for additional staff? I mean, is it, is it I guess what, what I'm asking sort of is, can you generalize the mix of bringing on new people, retraining existing employees and technology, and what, what's the mix among those three components or other components, if you are aware of any? Um, so it's important to have, depending on the size, possibly somebody that oversees this. Now, in larger companies, you might have a chief sustainability officer. In smaller companies, you might not. Um, uh, the key is, though, where is your employee's time best served? Um, and what we've noticed with most companies is data gathering and crunching and becoming carbon experts is typically not the case. Um, they, you want them to be making high level strategic decisions based on good information. Like you want them to be in your company making a difference, right? So um, just like, you know, in your field, uh, I don't think they want employees in there. I mean, you have general counsel, but you're still gonna go out to a specialist to talk about, you know, specific SEC disclosures, et cetera, because you don't wanna make a mistake and you wanna rely on the experts and then take that information and make good strategic decisions, right? So, so that's what we're seeing is that, um, companies are walking away from having internal employees with spreadsheets trying to create greenhouse gas inventories that may be not compliant or not repeatable. Um, they're starting to be worried that those employees could walk out the door and take their climate disclosures with them. Um, they're starting to be worried that if they used a particular consultant that put it in a report one way, then the next year they may not be able to do it again the same way and they don't have consistency. Right, so that's where technology comes in because it's so well suited to take large disparate data, keep it, slice it, create repeatable processes and have this continuous uh, one place for your organization to refer back to, to make those decisions. Great, I, we could probably go on with this topic for, for hours, but Tara, I, I, should, I should have said before, Tara is in California. So for those of you on the East Coast, we owe Tara a huge, debt of thanks for waking up so early and looking so awake. Um, I don't know how you do it, but it's working. So um, Tara, we're sort of switching here to the world of public companies, <clears throat> but um, I noticed in our in our attendee roster that there were a number of public companies represented in our, attendant, our attendees. Do you have any uh, statistics on how many companies have added climate change or similar types of metrics to their executive compensation plans? And separately, how many companies have provided third-party assurances to those metrics? Bob, I would be happy to share research. Um, pay governance has performed on climate performance metrics and executive incentive plans, as well as the broader use of E category and ESG. So to date, um, there have been about 40% of Russell 3000 companies that have incorporated ESG-related metrics into their executive incentive plans, with about 7% um, maybe 7 to 10 percent of Russell 3000 companies disclosing that environmental metric or metrics are used in executive incentive plans. By far, what we tend to see when it comes to ESG is social metrics tend to be um, the most common type of uh, category being used in executive incentive plans. But for those companies, Russell 3000 companies specifically, that have incorporated environmental metrics in their incentive plans, um, the median revenue is about $5 billion, and the median one-year average market cap is about $8 billion. The top industries that we, um, well, actually the top industry that we observe companies incorporating environmental metrics in executive incentive plans is energy and utilities. Um, so no surprise there. Followed by life science, healthcare, materials, industrials, and tech companies. But these industries are still few and far behind the trends we do see in energy and utility companies. The most common incentive vehicle to incorporate environmental related metrics is in the annual incentive plan and executives annual incentive plan. But we have also observed companies starting to incorporate um, environmental related metrics actually in the long term incentive plan. But it's still not a large number um, that we're seeing that type of use. 
And then I do predict that in future years, we definitely will see more and more companies consider the inclusion of environmental metrics in the long-term incentive program, especially as ESG environmental strategies are in full operation and investors continue to push companies to position their business models to promote a net zero economy. Now, with respect to um, the type of environmental metrics found in executive incentive plans, we have observed about 30% of companies incorporating carbon footprint, emission, energy efficiency like metrics in their programs. Um, this is by far the most common category of e-metrics found in executive incentive plans. There are definitely other metrics being incorporated such as chemical containment, um, environmental compliance, and there's responsible sourcing, water consumption, and, and safety. Um, but definitely, the, um, to the extent that companies are actually putting specific goals around um, the environmental component, carbon footprint emission, again, are, is the most common category. And then with respect to third-party assurance on metrics, you know, the Center of Audit Quality reported last year that more than half of the S&P 500 companies had some form of assurance over their ESG metrics. Um, as of June 2021 last year. Now, whether a company actually obtains third-party assurance on ESG metrics in the incentive plan really depends on how the organization is incorporating that metric into the program. To date, we have seen a number of companies incorporate metrics, an uh, environmental metric or metrics at, as a balanced scorecard approach, whereby it's not just the um, climate related or environmental metric that's being included, it's other strategic objectives as well. And usually with that approach, we see the compensation committee coming in and doing an aggregate overview in terms of how they will evaluate performance. Um, we did have a question from one of the attendees in the registration process. And the question was, um, what has been the most effective lever to tie climate change to manager compensation that you've seen? Now, with no disrespect to the questioner intended, um, it's not clear whether by manager he or she meant executives versus managerial levels, but you, you've talked about executive comp. Are you seeing any metrics being applied to maybe the second or third tier uh, down from, from top management? Yeah, I would say definitely the in terms of environmental safety, definitely a common metric applied across the board. Um, it doesn't matter if you're executive, manager, that is a common metric that we do see across all types of um, annual incentive plans, specifically in the energy and utilities industry. In terms of other types of environmental uh, metrics, again, climate change for existent or um, greenhouse um, gas emission reduction. We haven't seen those types of metrics incorporated as much in the manager based plans. We have seen them in the executive based plans. Um, so I think that's still kind of an area that will be um, maybe expanding over time, but I think companies are still trying to figure out how do we incorporate these metrics in the executive instead of plans, and how are we going to measure them? What are we going to measure? Because I will tell you, while there are a lot of good companies that are actually being specific in terms of the quantifiable approach that they're taking to metrics, um, there are still a lot of companies that will disclose in their proxy a focus on EHS, a focus on protecting the environment. They're not as quantifiable. Um, they're more qualitative in nature. Yeah, that, that's interesting because to me, um, you know, that, that speaks to the fact that the compensation committee or whatever committee of the board is evaluating executive compensation is applying discretion given the softness of those targets. And as you know, others, others may know as well, um, institutional investors are not big fans of committee discretion over executive comp, um, which sort of leads to a next question. I, I saw an article recently that uh, some investors believe that the use of, especially the use of these soft targets, but maybe even harder, more quantifiable targets are, are basically one more instance where uh, metrics are being used to increase compensation. Is I, I don't know whether you've, you've experienced that kind of investor feedback, <clears throat> excuse yeah. me, with respect to the clients that you've worked on. Yeah, I mean, I will tell you that pay governance actually performed a, a study, <laughs> given the critics, the ESG critics out there. Um, you know, to no surprise, with every trend, 
um, in executive compensation, there will always be critics. And actually, the inclusion of ESG in incentive plans is definitely the biggest trend we've seen in the executive comp area over the past seven years. Um, and so we actually decided to go ahead and analyze um, whether or not, you know, incorporating ESG metrics in incentive programs really do warrant higher payouts at the end of the day. So I do think there is definitely more time that is needed to understand whether ESG metrics and incentive arrangements would help um, with creating long-term shareholder value. We were able to just to kind of look at a sample of the S&P 500 companies, 100 specifically. Um, out of the sample, we identified 62 companies with financial, operational, and ESG metrics in the executive incentive plan. And our research concluded that ESG metrics reduced the overall payout or had no impact on the executive's bonuses at 75% of the organizations that we looked at. Now, I know the count is small, and we're going to continue to build out our research, but it definitely, um, you know, speaks to the fact that compensation committees are acting conservatively in evaluating the impact of ESG metrics have on the executive incentive payouts. But Bob, I also wanted to kind of touch on a comment that you made earlier about institutional investors and, and, and their perspective on including metrics. Um, while institutional investors are increasingly wanting companies to use greater rigor in assessing ESG performance as a whole to ensure that ESG risks are being actively mitigated, there hasn't been any push among institutional investors, at least the large institutional investors, for wanting to see specific metrics, ESG-related metrics, in incentive plans. For instance, in BlackRock's 2022 proxy voting guides, they actually said, we don't have a strong view on the use of ESG-related metrics in incentive plans. But they do believe that when ESG metrics are included in incentive plans, um, that these metrics are best aligned to shareholder interests when they, one, address issues that are material to a company's business model, two, are aligned with long-term strategic priorities, and three, incorporate the same rigor as financial and operational targets. So I just wanted to yeah. share that with the group and, and that's highlight. That's a really important observation. Number one, um, it, it, BlackRock in particular has been miscited in a whole bunch of areas. I mean, I remember when Larry Fink came out with his pronouncement, I think it was two years ago, about using SASB or TFCD or TF, I can never remember the acronym. Um, everybody said, oh my God, we've got to run out and do whatever, you know, whatever he said. But when you read it carefully, he was very clear that if a company felt that neither of those systems were appropriate for its business and its strategy, um, come up with your own. Just, you know, tell your story we think these are good frameworks in which to tell your story, but if you don't think they are, tell your story anyway. Just, you know, figure out what works for you. And it also, you, you've, re, you've re reinforced what um, Guida said before, that you, you don't do this sort of in the abstract, you do it in a manner that supports and maybe enhances your strategic goals, your drivers. Um, it's not some isolated thing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Bob, I had a... Sorry, to, uh, I had a quick oh, question okay. for Tara. Uh, yeah, I was uh, curious. Could you give some examples of the metrics um, that you're talking about? I mean, uh, from a practical level, and and maybe uh, you know how are they evolving? How have they evolved? Where do you see them evolving to? Um, but but just more of the practical. You know, what what are some of these metrics you're, you're referring to? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I mean they are definitely evolving first and foremost. I mean, I think. Prior to 2020, the, again, the most common E-like metric we found in plans was safety. So it's making sure that we minimize the incident rates um, and so forth. Um, with respect to carbon footprint and emission reduction, some of the example disclosures um, or some of the example metrics that have been included in the plans include you know, third-party assessments on greenhouse accounting was completed. That was an example of what was stated in the proxy. Another example is um, increased use of electricity from renewable sources by approximately 37%. Um, so they, they definitely do range in terms of how quantifiable they are um, with respect to the goal that needs to be achieved. But in other areas, we've also just seen reduced carbon emissions. 
<laughs> it's been as simple as that. At least what that's what's being communicated to shareholders. And again, as we think about executive compensation, it is really important to have more quantifiable goals that helps the shareholders understand the rigor that the committee is using to determine an appropriate payout for yeah. executives. Yeah, and, and another, I'm sorry, Robert, do you want to follow up with another question? Didn't mean to cut you off. No, I think that was Gaida. Oh, sorry, Gaida. No, I was just going to say that's really interesting, Tara, and I, I wonder if it's because companies are now, a lot of them are just in the process of, of measuring, right? So maybe that's all right. they can say at this point for many of them, like we will measure our carbon footprint, right? And we will do this, but once they do, once they have that system in place, they will be able to get to more specific metrics and even maybe bring them down to that department or executive level of where they come from. Um, I do think that right now companies are still figuring out how to get to that data. And then once they do, it might get more specific. Yeah. Right. Well, I think there's two parts to it as well. I'm sorry, Bob. I didn't no, go ahead. Off, but I think there's two parts to it. I mean, to the extent that you have an, an environmental strategy, you know, your, your ESG strategy in place, and to the extent that you've been measuring this, then it's easier to come up with what you're going to disclose in an SEC filing in terms of how you're going to measure executive pay. But I think, and I'll let Robert and, and Bob um, um, confirm this, if you don't know what you're measuring, or you, then I think it's better in an SEC disclosure to kind of just use that aggregate approach of not just not defining the goal specifically, but throwing it into a bucket of other strategic objectives for the executive in terms of what the committee will use to evaluate so that they don't become liable in, in terms of um, rewarding bad behavior at the end of the day. But Robert and Bob, I love your perspective on this because that's what I'm seeing is that they don't, number one, they either don't have the appropriate tools in place to measure um, or also they're not sure really what should be measured. And so therefore they're just throwing it into a general bucket in terms of their evaluation process. Well, uh, to me, the important takeaway here, <clears throat> and you've, you've all alluded to it in a way, is companies of all shapes and sizes you know we, we know we've we've heard from each of you that companies are pursuing this that they all have disclosure obligations irrespective of the sec proposal but in many respects and even though investors have been asking <clears throat> investors and others have been asking for this information for quite a while industry in general is still, is still taking baby steps um you know before they before they drill down and come up with a lot of specific metrics um, they really need to figure out what the right metrics are for them. And even as Larry Fink said, and again, I forget which year it was, maybe it was 2020 or 2021, you know, if this framework doesn't work for you, change your framework, do something else. But, you know, I think at this point, my view is you'd want to encourage experimentation, figure out what, what really is important for you, what really is supportive or enhancing to your strategic goals and your, and your, your performance drivers. Um, and the fact that you're seeing this in um, larger companies and particularly companies, as you said, in the energy industry, um, you know, that's how most things start out. Most of you know, um, maybe not the attendees, but I, the, the three of you know that I spent several years at Pfizer. Well, Pfizer was always the leader in a lot of governance issues, but over time, what Pfizer did, everybody's doing, or many people are doing now. So it does take time for this stuff to trickle down. I think you know companies need to. You're not going to put some you know put a, a, a tea bag, the functional equivalent of a tea bag in boiling water, and say you're done. It's going to take time and it's going to take a lot of thought and figuring out what right, what's right for you. We are running short on time, um, so I'm going to ask each of you to give a parting comment, as the ads used to say, in 25 words or less. Uh, <laughs> what's one takeaway you'd like to give? the attendees today, and I'm going to start out with Robert. Sure. Um, you know, paraphrasing a little bit of what I said earlier, I think, it, you know, keep an eye on on what's out there, what's coming um, from the agencies that, that regulate you, the states and cities and counties. You know, be aware of what is being compelled, but also, you know, what is valuable to your company um, to, to produce and produce it correctly and accurately. Um, in, in terms of telling your company's story. Um, and then the final thing, I guess, is, you know, pay attention very carefully to, to what type of data 
um, is being asked for or, or what format is, is the most valuable for, for your storytelling. Yeah. Gaida? So um, the biggest takeaways as you're starting, so wherever you are in the sustainability carbon accounting journey, um, make sure that you are backing up your claims with the right data so that as this regulation increases, as you're under this microscope, you feel confident uh, in what you're putting out into the world and it doesn't backfire, right? Um, so that would be my biggest takeaways. You know, back up your claims, have the right information behind it, um, and feel confident that you have the right team in place to help you do that. And last but not least, Tara. I would say that if a company is going to incorporate ESG into their executive senate programs, that they need to make sure that they incorporate metrics that really demonstrate to shareholders the company is rewarding executives for driving outcomes. All, all excellent takeaways. Um, I should probably have one of my own, but I'll exercise my prerogative as moderator and not do that. Um, we, we still have some time for questions. I haven't seen any posted, but uh, we welcome your involvement in that. And um, I also want to just remind you that within the next day or two, we will be sending an email with a Florida Bar CLE course number. Uh, for those of you who uh, are eligible for Florida CLE, we regret that we can't accommodate people in all 50 states. Um, but uh, maybe this is an inducement to become admitted in Florida. I don't know. Um, we will also send materials or links to materials that hopefully will be of interest to you. And you can see on the bottom here, contact information for me and each of the panelists. Uh, again, I encourage you to reach out to any or all of us with follow-up questions, comments, or otherwise. We're more than happy to help. And lastly, I realize I have four minutes. I technically have four minutes to go, but I'll I'll give you back three or four minutes of your lives. I, I cannot thank all of you for attending, and I particularly want to thank what I think are a fabulous group, is a fabulous group, excuse me, of panelists uh, today. I really learned a great deal. Um, you know, I, I didn't go into it thinking that I knew everything by far, but I, I certainly learned a great deal from each of you, and I sincerely, sincerely thank you for your efforts. We hope it was a good and valuable use of everyone's time today. I know I benefited from it. Um, tremendously. So thank you very much. Thank you for thank having you. us. Thank, thank you, Gunnar.